So today I will speak about something different than my task is not easy, it is Alison who has given to me, uh, uh, because he, uh, she told me that it would be good if I would speak a little bit about Alzheimer's disease, but at the same time if I can touch a little bit for the problem of chronic heart disease. So of course uh, these are very big um, uh, subjects and, and so what I uh, try to do is to uh, speak about chronic Lyme disease a little bit and speak about uh, Alzheimer's disease a little bit. And of course I cannot go and, uh, inside and cannot explain everything to you. However, the two uh, I have uh, given two review papers uh, in which you can see all the details. And after we will have many occasions to discuss uh, on the file. So, debate on chronic Lyme disease. In the history of syphilis, exactly the same debate occurred, like we have today in Lyme disease. And, there were, and, and it was for 50 years. And there were two groups, uh, one against the other, one telling that uh, uh, general paresis, which is one of the most important uh, chronic manifestations of, of neurosyphilis, which is nothing else as many important properties. The general paresis and can cause dementia. General paresis is, um, there is no general paresis without um, syphilitic infection. Uh, Kreplin was between those who told that without syphilis there is no general paresis. However, there were others, for example, Nonne, who told that, no, 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 this is completely, this is, this is completely different and one can ex exist without the others. And later, later on, the answer came from the neuropathology. And you are going to see why from the neuropathology. Uh, it was, it was um, in 1913, more than uh, almost exactly 100 years ago, that Nobushi um, and Moore showed the persistence of spirochetes in the brain of patients who suffered from general paresis. And the spirochetes were there even 10 years. 20 years, 30 years following the primary infection. Therefore, they were able to make a direct connection between the dementia or other uh, manifestation of um, syphilitic meningoencephalitis uh, and a direct involvement by the bacterium. Now, uh, what, uh, what I, I try to do is to now, uh, show to you the main manifestation of uh, tertiary neurosyphilis. Uh, like a, and compare it, not only the clinical but also the pathological manifestation, and compare it to that of Lyme disease. We checked all the literature uh, of the last 30 years with respect to Lyme neuroporeliosis, and we wanted to compare it uh, with the main manifestation of chronic, chronic uh, neurosyphilis. And we saw that if we can find similar pathological and clinical manifestations, and in addition, we are going to find uh, the spirochetes uh, present in the tertiary regions, what we can see that similarly to uh, neurosyphilis, chronic or late Lyme disease exist, and also that the spirochete can be uh, um, responsible for this late manifestation of the disease. Uh, with respect to neurosyphilis, it was proven around the, um, the, the middle of the last century that the spirochete is responsible for the late, late manifestation and they were able to find the spirochete at the site of uh, this different manifestation inside of the brain or other organs. So uh, the main stages of uh, neurosyphilis, uh, the first stage, the primary stage, the skin region, which is the skin, the secondary stage, uh, uh, which is mostly meningeal involvement, vasculitis, neuritis, the same as in Lyme disease. Now, there is a very big difference between the, this early stage of neurosyphilis and the late stage of neurosyphilis. In late or chronic neurosyphilis, you have parenchyma involvement. The brain is involved. It is involved in two different ways. One is the, the, the so-called meningovascular neurosyphilis, in which the meningeal vessels are involved by the spirochete, and 
uh, if it be becomes chronic, it will be a secondary intimal proliferation, thrombosis, and secondary cerebral infarct. Here, the brain parenchyma is not infected by spirochetes, but there will be a parenchyma involvement due to the vascular involvement. The second group is a uh, major manifestation of tertiary nerve series, is general paralysis. General paralysis is nothing else as a chronic meningoid hepatitis. But we have to know that there is two very important forms. One is the infiltrative form in which you have a very strong infoplasmacytic infiltration, and we will give the, the picture of the classical meningoid hepatitis that you can see in the brain or the uh, in the form of infoplasmacytic info infiltrates. But there is another form which is the autophic form in which you are not going to have infoplasmacytic infiltrates, but you are going to have a slowly progressive atrophy and the clinical symptoms of this one will be that of dementia. The third one, when there is this classical picture of meningoencephalitis, the symptomatology of the patients will depend on where we can find these inflammatory lesions. Uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, uh, Lyme disease, uh, you can see that there are more than 50 clinic, clinically and radiologically confirmed cases which were reported with respect to the meningovascular Lyme uh, neuroborreliosis. It was also pathologically confirmed about 20 years ago when uh, and we had done the first work on that because we had the opportunity to analyze the brain of a patient who died with cerebral infarcts and who had uh, intrathecal production of, of antibody or antibody in the, in the CSF, uh, the serology that was, was very strongly positive, and in the brain we were able to find what was called high male arteritis, which was at the time totally uh, typical for, for neurosyphilis, but later on it was shown that other bacteria and other infection can also cause it. This is what is typical, is the in intimal proliferation, uh, sometimes some inf inflammatory infiltrates in the adventitia, the secondary thrombosis and the cerebral infarct. And we were able to show the presence of spirochetes in the sub, sub uh, PR and uh, subatomal regions. It was at that time that I wanted to use a positive control in order to show the spirochetes. It was 1990. Uh, we, we didn't get at that time antibodies, so I wanted to use a serial information for spirochetes. And in my very big surprise, What's happened that in my positive controls, which came from a general parietal case, where I knew that the spiral case can be there, I had the picture of Alzheimer's disease. This started my, my, my hypothesis at that time that with higher magnification, I was able to see this, this very tightly spiraled treponema pallidum spiral case, that if treponema pallidum can do that and can reproduce the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, in this case, we can have other spiral cases which can do the same. And later on, I will speak with that, but just the link came from here. Now, the second uh, mature form of uh, chronic neurosyphilis can also be found in, uh, in Lyme disease, which is meningoencephalitis. Meningoencephalitis, which has, as I told you, two forms. This is an infiltrative form. The number of clinically and pathologically confirmed cases with Lyme uh, meningoencephalitis, myelitis, encephalitis, and uh, process myelitis is very high. And many of them were also pathologically con confirmed. Here I am showing just one case, uh, which was published by Liga and collaborators, and where the CDC showed also the presence of a spiral case. You can see the very uh, strong involvement of the brain, uh, and also the very strong meningitis, but also infiltration of the parenchyma. And here you can even see the giant cells, uh, which was very typical, for example, in the <coughs> gumatous lesion of syphilis. And this form can only occur in the late or chronic form of uh, Lyme neuroborreliosis. Not the other, other form, it was the atrophic form. In the atrophic form, I told you there is no infoplasmosis infiltration, but uh, the bacteria will, will grow more and more, and there is a progressive, slowly progressive tissue atrophy and pure dementia. In this case, so this is also meningoencephalitis, but I will explain to you why uh, we have no need for specific infiltration. And uh, for, from this form also, uh, many cases were published clinically, radiologically, 
by showing also by MRI the, the cortical atrophy and the, the cognitive decline. Uh, and there were also several uh, who were pathologically confirmed uh, and the presence of spiral kids was, sh was shown at, at, uh, the first time by Paul Duray and uh, uh, Alan McDonald and later on other, uh, other authors. Now, as you can see here, the, the uh, spiral kids will proliferate in the brain. They can uh, show these individual filaments in the neuropil, in the cerebral cortex, in, and they can, they can form colonies. I will show you later on another picture. It, it means that they are only to get together and form masses, and this is what we are calling today mostly biofilms. Uh, I was always using colonies. Now, with respect to chronic Lyme disease, you, you will see that we can find all the forms of uh, tertiary forms uh, which occur in late or chronic neurosyphilis, also in Lyme disease. It was published in, in uh, uh, good journals with, with uh, many authors, uh, many of them were pathologically confirmed, and the spiral kit uh, was found found in the site of the tertiary region. So we can say, I think in conclusion, the substantial amount <coughs> of data are available and show that the major pathological forms of uh, late or chronic neurosyphilis also occur in lung disease. This represents evidence of late or chronic lung neuroparaliosis. Borrelia burgdorferi can persist in host tissue. Borrelia burgdorferi in a similar way to toponym palatum can be responsible for this chronic late neuropsychiatric manifestation of lab neuroporeliosis. These observations are indicative of ongoing infection and point to the necessity of careful consideration of borreliobundafer infection in the etiology of stroke, dementia, of psychosis, mood disorders, and various other neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with Lyme disease. Of course, I am going to show to you what we have done in Alzheimer's disease. We should do exactly the same of these various uh, disorders, so the pathological confirmation of the presence of spiral kids is needed. Uh, the existence of late Lyme disease is approved by all official guidelines in the US, Canada, and Europe. The terms late and chronic Lyme disease, as in syphilis, are synonyms and de define tertiary neurospiral ketosis. And you have uh, uh, good uh, uh, references only in two days, uh, very important literature. The use of chronic Lyme disease as a different entity is inaccurate and can be confusing. Chronic Lyme disease starts after six months of duration of the, of the illness. So I think that uh, simply we should, um, after six months, uh, if there is a persistence in symptoms, it is important just to, just to say that uh, the serology or the activity of the infection is still there, or to say that no, we have discovered another disorder, so discard other disorders, and if we don't know, we should just say that we don't know, and the patient should be uh, followed uh, for several years to see what's happening. We should know that in neurosyphilis, the, the serological tests were sometimes fluctuating, and we have examples in which we have uh, um, a very, very low level of serology in the, in, the, in the blood, but we have very high serology in the brain. I, I think just we should be open, but uh, I think that chronic Lyme disease, uh, there are many evidence that chronic Lyme disease exists. Now, with respect to Alzheimer's disease, uh, as I showed you, uh, told you that I was starting this study when then we have seen the pathological elements of Alzheimer's disease present in general paralysis, and it makes sense because we have an example that chronic bacterial infection can cause dementia. If this is the fact, and this is the fact, I think it's our obligation to go in this direction and, and see uh, effectively whether it can cause or not. In addition, it was a spirochetal infection. So what we, when we started the study, and you can see in Alzheimer's disease, the lesions have filamentous lesions. They can form masses, and they can be also disseminated uh, as filaments, and they can also accumulate uh, inside of the of, of neurons. Uh, they show also pyrophorin staining, and Borrelia burgdorferi, like other spiral kids, can also be stained by pyrophorin. I was surprised when I knew, but I have uh, analyzed whether uh, we can stay with the same staining uh, the filaments of Alzheimer's disease and that of spiral kids, and we can. 
And now, what is Alzheimer's disease? As I showed you to you, these are these fundamental lesions, and the biological hallmarks are beta amyloid, which accumulates in the in senile plaques, and the tau, which is a, a microtubule bind, uh, microtubule associated protein, and when it is uh, pathologically phosphorylated, uh, it uh, cannot uh, uh, the microtubule assembly will be um, altered, and uh, there will be an accumulation of phosphorylated tau. Now, sometimes you can have uh, both biological marker inside of the same model. Now, uh, and here, um, I would like just uh, to show to you a review which was published uh, one, years, uh, one year ago, in which we have again reviewed all the data of the literature with respect to the presence of spirochetes in, uh, in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, as we started to, to, to do it, as we were promised that several types of spirochetes can be involved in Alzheimer's disease, we uh, used neutral techniques and more than uh, uh, 100 cases were analyzed that we had found the presence of spirochetes in all cases. In controls, without any Alzheimer's changes, we didn't find. You can see that the, sub, uh, the, the significance statistically is very high and the risk factor is also very high. Now with respect to other spiral kids, because this was what uh, we saw that the predominant, predominant spiral kids are the oral pathogen spiral kids. Many people have oral pathogen spiral kids. And interestingly, today, there are more than nine that are found to be invasive. And if it's true that spiral kids are very, um, have a very high uh, affinity for the central nervous system, I think, uh, and perhaps they can behave in the same way. It was a group here in the US who have uh, shown the presence of uh, six different perionotal pathogen spirochetes in the brain using species-specific DNA and species-specific antigens. And uh, it was another point which is very, very important that several types of spirochetes can coinfect together, and in five cases, periodontal pathogen treponema spirochetes co-infected together with bacteria. Here again, the stati statistical significance and the risk ratio was very high. Now, about Lyme disease. I was expected, expecting from the beginning, the beginning that only part of the cases can be in, uh, of Alzheimer's patients, uh, Borrelio, can be involved and will be involved. And here, uh, you can see that I am adding uh, all cases together, which is uh, 124 brains uh, done, of course, by different groups. All the positive and all the negative cases were included. About 23% of the, of, of the Alzheimer's patient showed a positive serology for Borrelia Bundefrey uh, and uh, was uh, 13 times higher in Alzheimer's disease than in controls. Again, the statistical significance was very, very high uh, together with the risk factor. Now, what we have done is that we, we tried uh, to, when we put together all this data, we wanted to, to analyze following objective criteria of his and Koch whether this data can show a possible causal relationship between the spirochetal infection and the dementia of the Alzheimer's uh, And you, you can see the paper because I have no time. What, what are these nine different criteria of his, but you are going to see that it's just uh, surprising how much uh, we can say that uh, the, there is um, the, the, the criteria are speaking about uh, uh, are in favor of uh, uh, causal relationships in between them. Now, perhaps the only point is that at this at this stage we should we should get a lot of energy and go and see all these different types of spirochetes and other co-infecting bacteria in order to explain the mental, and I think this is again our obligation to do. Now I would like just to show you an example how we try to show that Borrelia bultoferi is involved in uh, those Alzheimer's patients who were positive for Lyme disease. So we cultivated the spiral case, we have done a molecular analysis together with the Porcel Dental Center uh, in Harvard University, and we have found uh, by the serological uh, molecular analysis and phylogenetic analysis that it was already about the very census tape. We have also done other analysis, analysis of these parakids. But in order to be sure that it is not just an artifact, we wanted to see what's happening with the serology of these patients. So we were able to see the serology in the CSF and in the, in the blood. Three different laboratories have done independently the, the, uh, uh, the tests. And 
you, you can see that we have a positive serology. This is a positive control. We had a positive serology in two of them, in, including the uh, ELISA and the uh, FIT, as well as the SPAN blood. And in one case, the EGME was even more positive than in the, that in the control, control case. I am not. Uh, it would be something interesting to tell, but we have no time, so I am uh, continuing. Now, we wanted also to see what's happening in the brain of these patients, because it was important also to, to, to see whether uh, the spiral kits are there. Here you have an example of, of general paresis, and look, it, we have the same picture of spiral kit and masses in the brain of this patient. Uh, the spiral kit and antigens were distributed in the same manner the beta amyloid, which is a biological marker of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, OSP uh, positive anti uh, antigen was also found, found, found in, in filaments in neurofibular tangles as an individual filaments in the brain. Furthermore, uh, the uh, speci uh, borrelia specific uh, DNA was also found by in situ hybridization distributed in the same way as the antigen. And we wanted to do not PCR but in, in situ hybridization because we, we wanted to exclude the possibility of an uh, artifact by the host DNA. Uh, we wanted also to see whether we can reproduce not Alzheimer's type changes in, in uh, organotypic and in primary cell cultures, and you can see the beta amyloid positive plaque like structures in the infected cultures, which was similar to that found in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, uh, neurofibrillary tongue like and even granulovacular like changes were, uh, were induced in vitro. Furthermore, um, in, um, it was a, a collaboration also with the US. We uh, have seen uh, by Thioflavin S the spiral kit in those plaques, and inside we wanted to see the spectrum uh, of the, the bacteria spiral kit in those plaques, and it corresponded to beta sheet formation. So then we really wanted also to verify with West Standard, and you can see that in the spiral kit, infected cultures, we have the band of the beta amyloid, furthermore, an increase in APP, which is the precursor of the beta amyloid, increased phosphorylated tau, which are the biological markers of Alzheimer's disease. So we, um, I think that we should do a little bit the same things with, with other spiral kits, and perhaps we are going to uh, have a higher, um, so we, we should uh, do the same in order to prove each point that this is really like this. Now, how this can, how is the pattern mechanism? How spiral kits can lead to chronic infection? Uh, uh, spiral kits, like other bacteria, have uh, peculiar uh, molecules, which are the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which are different of ours, and we are going to recognize them. And to recognize them, there is a group of receptors which are called toroid-like receptors, are particularly very important because they are intercellular and they can, through the signaling pathway, modify gene expression of inflammatory molecules and activate the innate and the adaptive immune system. Once done, the spiral kits will be destroyed. Once by the uh, terminal membrane attack complex and the other side by the specific antibodies. Interesting, yes, in three minutes I think I finished. Um, it was interesting just that the beta amyloid uh, was found to be an antimicrobial peptide recently by uh, one of the collaborators was uh, Rudy Tanz in Harvard University. And what's happening when the spiral kids uh, escape from destru destruction by the host? They are, they are able to put uh, com uh, com or complement proteins on their surface. We are not going to be able to recognize, they are going to proliferate, and they are going to attack our cells. And this will be the two phenotypes, one very rich lymphoplasmocytic infiltrates, few spirochates, uh, a lot of uh, spirochates, and no lymphoplasmocytic infiltrates, as we are not going to recognize them. And I think now I, I, my conclusions, which will be very short, here's criteria. Uh, for the support of a causal relationship between spiral kits and Alzheimer's disease are uh, fulfilled. This you, shall, you should check the, the paper. Various types of spiral kits are involved in Alzheimer's disease, including borrelia butterfly, periodontal pathogen spiral kits, and probably uh, more others. In analogic treponema polydome, they may be dementia, cortical atrophy, and amyloid deposition. 
as suggested by Hill, once the probability of a causal relationship is established for pos possible, we should give a lot of attention uh, to such work for further studies. We need money uh, for all the land. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very, very important. And infectious etiology unifies the hypothesis of uh, proposed to play a role in Alzheimer's disease in a comprehensive entity. The patholo pathological process begins long before the diagnosis of dementia is made. Therefore, we should start very early the detection with appropriate serological test with appropriate um, antibiotic or I think we need to, to um, uh, make research also for other antibacterial agents in order to prevent dementia. Thank you very much for your attention.